All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. Today, we are interviewing Aaron Lipkin, who is involved with Joshua's Altar and the very recent, possibly earth-shaking find of the curse tablets that are mentioned in Joshua chapter eight. Aaron, welcome to the show. Shalom. Or Aaron, Shalom, welcome Greg. to the show. Thank, thank you for having um, me. Can you give us just a little bit, starting off, a little bit of a background? of yourself. How did you get involved with Joshua's altar to begin with? Well, um, I'll start with with my personal testimony as a Jew, as a Jew, a secular Jew growing uh, in the, in Jerusalem, uh, the, 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 the Israeli educational system, what they taught you in school, in the secular schools is, I would say the secular version of the Bible or the what we call the critical view of the Bible, which means that the Bible is not a, a historical valid document. Um, the Many of the stories that are described in the Bible, specifically um, the Exodus, uh, the bondage in Egypt, uh, the wandering in the desert, the conquest of Joshua, <clears throat> all of these never happened. Moses and Joshua never existed. This was what was taught in Israeli schools for secular uh, uh, Jews, and uh, that's what I was taught. And growing up in a in a house that was pretty traditional, pretty conservative, uh, very respectful of the Bible and uh, believing in God, this was very foreign to me, and 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 really bothered me as a kid. And uh, you know, growing up and becoming a a man, getting married. Um, one day I walk in Jerusalem and I see a, a, a lecture that's going to be in that week archaeology by the name of Adam Zertal, and uh, he was going to speak about Joshua's altar. Now, I knew what Joshua's altar was. I knew what, what the event was, was, was all about, but it was a surprise for me to see that the professor of archaeology is teaching about an event that I knew that the academic world didn't believe really happened. So I went to that lecture, and uh, from that point on, I was involved with Professor Zertal and his team uh, in the research, the archaeological research of the biblical heartland of Israel. But that lecture really, really changed um, my life. And, and, and that discovery that he spoke about, Joshua's altar, changed Professor Zertal's life as well. Uh, and let's, let's stop for a second and just understand exactly what we're talking about. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses commands the Israelites to do a ceremony of blessings and curses uh, the vicinity of two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal, near the city of Shechem, Madlis. And uh, the Shechem. commandment was to, yeah, Shechem. And the, the commandment was to proclaim the blessing on Mount Gerizim, the curse on Mount Ibal. And there's also a very specific commandment to build an altar of uncut stones on Mount Ibal. Um, and so during the ages, uh, the, the archaeologists have been looking for that structure. If there is an altar that was built, it has to be found, and they didn't find it. Uh, and then in the 1980s, there, Adam Zertal, an atheist professor uh, who, who also grew up on, on the, the, the mythological view of the Bible that these stories never happened, is surveying the slopes of Mount Ibal and suddenly stumbles upon a mysterious compound uh, with a pile of stone at the highest point. And so he decides to excavate it. And in 1982, he starts his excavation all the way to 1989. And to make a long story short, Adam Zertal finds Joshua's altar. He finds a a huge, one-of-a-kind Israelite altar made out of uncut stones, full of bones and ashes of of, uh, pure animals that that are, are, are specifically listed in the the Bible is permitted to be sacrificed. Goats, sheep, uh, oxes, cows, they're all young animals, they're all um, uh, male. And so all of this fits the... Now, now with with the uh, the sacrificial animals, for example, why is that so important, right? Because you do have a lot of, let's say, Canaanite sacrifices or or other, uh, you know, Middle Eastern tribes that are 
sacrificing animals. Why, what, how does this show so much that it is an Israelite altar? That's a good question. And, and, and you know, another question is if we can even use the word Israelite. Uh, according to the academic world, uh, the mainstream view in archaeology is that you can't even use that word because uh, we weren't really Israelite. We we're actually Canaanite. Mm -hmm. They have this whole theory about us Jews or Israelites being Canaanites that rebelled against the Canaanite uh, leaders or kings of, of the Canaanite city, then we fled to the to the mountain. They have this this theory about our our origin, our sources. And you and made totally, up the history to like make it a, your a separate identity. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, if, if an Israeli archaeologist says this is an Israelite pottery or this is an Israelite building, that's it. His his academic career is gone. <laughs> you can say Philistine pottery. You can uh. say Persian pottery. You can say Roman pottery. But you can't say Israelite because then you're biased. You're, you're, you believe in the historicity of the Bible and nobody can trust your, uh, your research. So um, uh, going back to, to your question, um, when, when, how do you identify an Israelite site? And there, there, there are a couple of criteria that are so you know, accepted, I would say, in the archaeological world. Um, for example, one of them is four-room houses. They were very typical of the Israelite culture. Uh, believe it or not, all, all Israelites lived in the same type of house for centuries. And this is quite uh, phenomenal, I think. Uh, the fact that, um, that they're all using the same uh, vessels, the same uh, material culture. Uh, if you find a colored dream jar, most chances it's an Israelite site. Um, but I think that the clearest example of, of identifying an Israelite site is um, the, the, the fact that you don't find bones of non-kosher animals. Uh, usually Israelite sites don't have pig bones, donkey bones, horse bones uh, as part of the bone deposits that you find in the houses or wherever. Another thing that you need to ask is how do, if, if you already identified an Israelite site, how, how can you claim it's a cultic site? How can you claim that it's a, it's, it's a site that wasn't used for civilian purposes, for dwellings, for uh, military purposes, but for spiritual purposes? And, uh, and again, you know, there, there's, there's a whole list of criteria that, need, to, that, that you need a site to fit to those criteria. And uh, Joshua's altar, the altar on Mount Ibar, definitely fits both Israelite and cultic purposes. So, okay, so it fits that. And then we'll, we'll get into some other ways that I think that this is going to fit in. Now, how did you get involved with it? You were saying, you were saying that you, you saw Adam Liber, Liber, or Zertov was, uh, was giving the, uh, the lecture. How did you then begin become involved with the altar? So um, it, 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 all of this was parallel to my... Uh, business initiative, which was to um, establish a, a tour agency that was uh, specifically aimed at bringing the Christian groups to Judea and Samaria, Israel's biblical heartland. Unfortunately, most tourists that come to Israel for the Bible, they want to visit biblical sites, don't visit where the Bible happened, mm -hmm. which is really, really, I think, a paradox. Uh, and the reason for that is that the area we're talking about, Judea and Samaria, is also called uh, by some the West Bank. Um, this is an area that uh, some people are a bit afraid to visit. Uh, and, and there's really no need to be afraid. We're, we brought in the last 20, the past 11 years, we've brought thousands of tourists, Christian tourists from all over the world to Hebron, Bethel, Shiloh, Joshua's altar. And so after this, you know, attending his lecture and after establishing my travel agency, I uh, started bringing groups to Joshua's altar and also inviting Adam Zertal to speak to my groups at the hotel mm -hmm. the night before or after that visit. And, um, and so we became, you know, very close. And I remember just a few months before passing away, I asked Adam Zertal if he uh, advertises his... Uh, his books on, on Kindle and, and, you know, on Amazon. 
and he, you know, there was this silence on the phone, and he said, Aaron, I'm just a professor. I don't know how to do these things. Help me. <laughs> so this was, this was his last request from me just before uh, passing away, and I took, I took the job. I, 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 we publish all of Zertal's books in English. Uh, we uh, published them on, on uh, Kindle, and uh, parallel to that, I'm also a very gifted drone photographer. So uh, I, I, I use my drones to take shots of the different sites that Zertal's team finds during the, their, their archaeological survey, and they publish these photos in the survey books that, uh, that are very, very appreciated in the academic world. So I'm really part of the team in many aspects in many ways, and it's a great honor for me to be that. Okay. So I know you've got some images and stuff. Do you want to start sharing some of that and, and, and show us what you have of the, uh, of Joshua's altar there? Okay. So, um, so this is a, a presentation that uh, I, I usually show in churches and synagogues um, about the discovery of the, the Mount Ebal inscription that we just found from Joshua's altar and uh, usually give a, a very uh, short uh, explanation on the altar and and um, and and the this is Adam's Zertal. Um and uh, what we're talking about this this uh, important ceremony that we're talking about is um, probably one of the most important ceremonies in the Bible. The only pla the, the 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 second place where the whole nation of Israel convened together to to basically. Uh, make a covenant with the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, just like Mount Sinai, we have a list of uh, commandments, or this, in this case, curses uh, for people who do not fulfill the commandments. Um, and uh, in, in both cases, we have the whole nation of Israel um, basically making a covenant with God. And so this ceremony is parallel, it parallels to Mount Sinai, and um, and so the, the, the main commandment is to build an altar of uncut stones. It's to uh, put plaster, to write on the plaster the words of the Lord, the words of the commandments. And um, what we're going to do now is basically move to uh, the discovery in the 1980s. So we see that Adam Zertal uh, and his crew received in 1978 a very specific area, uh, the Jordan Valley and uh, the uh, slope, the... the, the mountain ridge of the tribal land of Menashe. And um, during this survey, they find amazing stuff. They find clear proof of the Israelite conquest, the Israelite invasion into Canaan. Um, we, won't, we won't go into that. Uh, they find uh, uh, several footprint structures that are believed to be the ancient worshiping site of the Israelites. And they find the, um, the compound which is one of those footprint structures on Mount Ibal where the altar stood. Aaron, Aaron let, me, let me interject here just for a second here. So uh, one, one reason, just real quick, right, because I think it's very interesting uh, as far as looking at archaeological evidence for the, let's call it, the, the, the arrival of the Israelites into the Promised Land, is that there is for a, at least a couple hundred years really nothing in these areas right? Correct. As far as findings we, for, for showing that people live there. And then all of a sudden, there's a massive amount of, of archaeological evidence that there were at least some nomads or semi-nomads, a large number in the area. Isn't that correct? Correct. What we see in front of us um, is a very, I would say, as, as we say in Hebrew, a, a boring map, a dry map. Mm -hmm. um, on, the, on, the, on the left side, we see a map of all the sites from a very specific time called the Late Bronze Age, roughly between 1500 and uh, 1300 or 1250, depending on who you ask. Um, the, the area of the Jordan Valley is empty. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody is living there. As we move from the Late Bronze Age to the Early Iron Age, uh, we see um, uh, an explosion of settlements in the uh, Jordan Valley between north of Jericho and up to Beit She'an. And um, th these are semi-nomadic uh, settlements, and they are, are the same culture that eventually builds 
those footprint structures, as well as the one on Mount Dibal, where the altar was found. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this is, this is something that was done in the past, I would say, 20 years, or maybe 30 years. All these findings um, are documented in the survey results of Professor Zertal and his crew. They did not look for evidence for the conquest or the uh, invasion. They did not look for it. They just documented what they found. Well, they're and, mostly uh, atheists, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, but but when, when you look at the evidence, it's clear that you have a, an anomaly, a very strong anomaly here, su- a sudden appearance of a culture at the Jordan Valley from nowhere. Well, we know, we know from where, but, uh, but uh, this, if, 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 if my Bible teacher in high school said that, you know, the, the conquest never happened because there's no evidence, now we can say there is evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is exactly what we see here. It's still going to be an uphill battle with that, but yes. Oh, to- totally, because yeah. here, let, let me just stop for a second and, and, and you know, let's, not, let's be unpolitically correct. Um, <laughs> Please. The, 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 the left wing, the academic world, um, pictures himself as objective. They are the truth. They are the, the, the ones that are, are sincerely looking for, uh, for the, 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 the full truth, the full reality. Whereas people who are right wing, people who are uh, believing in God and in the Bible, there's, they are subjective. They can never be uh, accounted on because the, the way that they see the reality is, 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 is crooked. It's, it's, not, it's not objective. It's not uh, scientific. And so, you know, us right-wing people who believe in God, who believe in the Bible, who believe in providence, we will never be acknowledged by the left as, as right. Never. Because we are crazy. We, we believe in, in an, an imaginary friend called God and so on and so forth. So, so you know, you hear, you hear the anger in my voice. Uh, yes. but this, is, this is the reality. The reality is that that the, the, the academic world is ruled by people with a very specific religion called atheism. That religion it doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in the Bible, doesn't believe in providence, doesn't believe in the miracles described in the Bible and the stories of the Bible. And, and, and they coerce their religion on our, our students, our, our children that we send to colleges. So, so, you know, I'm saying the opposite. We can count on their research because their research is not objective. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, and, it's, yeah. it's secularism versus faith, kind of. It, it's, it's, it's about, I know several biblical scholars that have left academia because there's no theology there, right? There, there's, there, there's no, let's study about the beliefs. And, and it, it's all about either inspecting the text Right and analyzing, critiquing the text, or its archaeological findings. You know, it's kind of those two things are the are the focus of biblical scholarship. A lot of people that don't aren't involved with that. They say, "Well, how can that be? This is about the Bible." Well, like anything else, I mean, eventually secularism kind of takes takes over these I'll, departments. I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that really makes me, you know, make my it's my blood burn <laughs> is the total disrespect of the um, you know, atheist academic world towards tradition, towards the, uh, the, the intelligence of, of human beings. Um, you know, they think that one day this, this very charismatic guy called Moses invents, if he even existed, invents a, a, a whole theology, and suddenly you have you know, hundreds of thousands of people that are, are believing his lies, believing his, his invented religion, and they go after it. And, and you know, that's, that's total disrespect of, of, of the human's intelligence, of tradition, of, of, of you know, passing on truths from one generation to the other. Um, it's, anyway, let's, let's concentrate on the positive. Okay, let's uh, do it. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so we have... We have the settlement influx. We have the footprint structures. And in 1980, Adams Rathal describes this amazing 
mysterious site on the slopes of Mount Ibal that no one ever found in a remote location. Um, he sketches it, and in his sketch, you see that there are there's an inner division in the footprint structure. Uh, one area leads to the other through stairs, and um, there on the, on the highest place there is a pile of stone that uh, really attracts his attention, uh, mixed with a lot of uh, ar early Iron Age pottery. May I say Israelite pottery? Sure. Israelite pottery <laughs> uh, mixed in 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 the in the uh, in the stones, and he starts excavating it. He finds a really peculiar. A structure uh, made out of uncut stones, uh, a ramp and a double ramp. Um, the uh, the rectangular box that uh, that he found after uncovering the structure was sealed, and so he opened it. And inside, that's where they found all the bones and the ashes. Uh, as we what, said, what do you mean it was sealed? What do, what do you mean by sealed, Aaron? Sealed. Okay, uh, you, you, there is a ramp leading up to a rectangular box of stones, mm -hmm. a high ground. And so this high ground was a, was basically a, a box that was sealed on the top of it with a floor. So mm -hmm. what you see right right in front of you right now is if you would if you would look at it before Adams Rital excavated inside, it was sealed. Okay. Uh, it, it was just closed with stone. And so what the hotel did was to open it, and and then with that, when he found the, uh, I would say two meters. So the actually. Israelites would have sealed this when they were done with it. Oh, correct. They sealed okay. it. Um, the question is, it's not clear, because the question is, was it sealed? Was it sealed, and then uh, they sacrificed on top of it, and then eventually after stopped stopped. Stopping to use it, they decommissioned it by covering it with a pile of stones, mm -hmm. um, or, or, or like you said, when they stopped using it, they 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 closed it all the way uh, to you no, know, not to because the ashes and the bones are holy, and so you can't you can't let them get out of it. So it, it, it's it's a good question. You're actually asking a good question. Mm -hmm. um, Zertal continued excavating inside until he gets to the bedrock and uh, all the way down at the bedrock he sees another installation or altar that uh, that is in the center of that high ground uh, and we, we you know we'll mention it uh, later on he also finds Egyptian jewelry he finds scarabs and a stone dice um, a pumice chalice that was used for cultic purposes and lots of plaster, which is really uh, reminiscent of, of the commandment in the Bible that says that plaster needs to be uh, applied on the And this stone. is limestone, right? Yes, this is Yeah, this is limestone. limestone. I think, is, is it Mount Ebal and, and Gaudacine? They're, they're both, I think they're mostly limestone. Right, yes. Um, the, the question is, is the plaster that was found in the altar from the local stone? And uh, just a few weeks before traveling to the U.S., I went there to take samples for the researcher that is actually checking that specific question. Hmm. And okay. So that's going to be interesting to see what the answer is. And so Zertal doesn't know what this uh, structure is. And um, thanks to the help of a, a, a religious Jew that uh, happened to pass by while he was sketching uh, the altar, Adam Zertal understood that what he sees is an Israelite altar, according to the sketch that appears in the Mishnah, a, a Jewish a, a book from the Second Temple period that describes mm. the the uh, Second Temple altar. This is we're seeing the, the sketch of the Second Temple altar, which is about thirteen hundred years after Joshua. So, uh, in other words. We, we, what we see is a description of an Israelite altar at the Second Temple period, and we see how the tradition, you know, I just mentioned how the academic world doesn't, doesn't take the, the tradition seriously, but the tradition of building an altar, the, the structure, the architecture, moved for so many years from the time of Joshua all the way down to the Second Temple. But this picture that Zertal saw is the picture that changed his life because for the first time he understood that the the the, 
the uh, structure that he found is indeed not just Israelite, but an Israelite altar. And if this is an Israelite altar on Mount Ibal, he made the conclusion immediately. This is Joshua's altar. And if this is Joshua's altar, he said to that religious Jew, then, then Joshua existed and Moses existed and the exodus happened. And this is the, uh, this is the exact moment that uh, Zertal became a believer in the historicity of the Bible, mm-hmm. or as I like to, to call him, a born-again archaeologist. <laughs> now, the ramp here, Aaron, is does this have to do with the law that there cannot be steps going up to the altar? Correct. Okay. Uh, when we see the uh, book of Exodus, the book of Exodus gives us a very clear uh, description of how and is how the Israelites should build should build a stone altar. And so, mm-hmm. when we're looking uh, at this verse, it says, "If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it." And then the second commandment is, "And do not go up to my altar on steps, or your private parts may be exposed." <laughs> right. And so, the 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 Bible doesn't say what we should do. It mm-hmm. says what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't yeah. build stairs. Well, it's practical. And so, and so, what, 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 what do we have left? A ramp. Uh-huh. So, uh, so this is this is exactly what we see on the on, on the Temple Mount uh, at the Second Temple period, and also this is what we see um, at, at Joshua's altar. We see a ramp. We see a double ramp, and we see a bama, a box, uh, which is coincidentally or not filled with bones and ashes of only kosher animals. Of only what kosher animals, be? yeah. And, uh, as, and uh, Professor Steger from Harvard University said, if there is an altar on Mount Ibal, as the tal claims, we biblical scholars should all go back to kindergarten. Yeah. So, I think, um, didn't he kind of say that mockingly? Yes, exactly. Yeah. He said, he said, he said it in a way that means that that, could, that cannot be yeah. the altar. <laughs> yeah, because exactly. If, if, it, that if, cannot... it is, if it is, we were, we were wrong all the way. Well, it really upends everything, right? And the, the whole narrative that is built up, uh, e- either from the critical point of view or, or, or the, uh, um, you know, the Exodus never happened. They were, ne- you know, the Jews or the Israelites were never in Egypt. Uh, it just upends everything that they've learned for decades and decades and decades. Right. And so it's, it's, and that's why when we get here to the, to the curse tablets, where there's even more evidence. It, it is earth shaking. It, it just, it would change everything. I just wonder, the pushback is going to be extreme on this, I think. Yes. And uh, with, with the, uh, with the curse tablets. And, already, already has been. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Cause the, the uh, we'll, we'll get to the curse tablets in a minute. We'll get to that in a yeah. minute. But now there were, there were three different altars here, right? There, there's an original altar that's down low. And then there's two more. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay, so, so that's the, the other two were just built over the uh, let me the seventy period time the seventy year time that the that the altar was in use. So um, w- when you speak to evangelical uh, archaeologists, they believe that the round installation at the center of that box of the ra- the bigger altar um, is the 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 altar of Joshua. Mm-hmm. Um, this was the, the first level. This was the, the most ancient altar that was built. And then um, the Israelites decided to build a bigger altar uh, on it. And, and the interesting thing is that the altar that they build on top of it is not a round altar like the one that we saw at the center, but uh, that rectangular altar with ramps, uh, which for, for me and, and for those archaeologists is a clear sign that the Israelites made the decision to make that point and uh, not just a, a one-day ceremony mm-hmm. location, but a permanent place of worship, just like the temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the altar just that, that was built just like the altar of the temple in the second temple period. It also resembles the, 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 the altar of the tabernacle. This is, uh, this is a clear sign that the site became the central place of worship, uh, the temple, so to say, of the Israelites 
uh, after that ceremony was done. And then after 50 or 60 years of use uh, of that site, it was covered intentionally by stones uh, to decommission it in a respectful way. Um, and so that, that is why when Zertal came there, all he had to do was peel off the, the outer layer and they find the structure intact mm. after thousands of years of earthquakes and what have you. So, so this is the different uh, layers. And, and, but it's important to say that when we look at, at, at this site archaeologically, it's still a one-layer site. In other words, when you go to a tell like Megiddo or, or, or Shiloh or Chatzor, what you see is basically a, a city that was built up during the ages and was ruined and was rebuilt again. And so you have layers and layers of civilizations and, 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 and peoples and religions from different times. Um, and, and so when we're talking about Joshua's altar, we're talking about a one-layer site. We're talking about a site that was only used at the end of the late Bronze Age, the beginning of the, the, the early Iron Age, Mm -hmm. And then that's it. Nobody ever used it again afterwards. So anything yeah. that we find there uh, in that in the vicinity of the altar inside that footprint compound is probably 99% from the time of Joshua. Of oh, that period, yeah, that 70-year period, okay. So you guys go there, you have a, a uh, uh, or, or, or there's, there, there's talk about why there hasn't been as much uh, excavation there that there could have been. I mean, this was found in the early 80s. So here we are 40 years later. What, what has gone on in the meantime and what has held up some of the archaeological work on the site? So there are a couple of things. First of all, after every excavation, there's a final report. And when that final report is published, um, what you have is basically peer review. You have a discussion in the academic world. Uh, this professor says, no, he was wrong. This professor says, no, you're wrong. There's a whole discussion there. And, but the moment the final report is out there, the excavation becomes a fact. And uh, because the final report on the altar wasn't written until today, uh, then then nobody ever, nobody really took the the uh, the excavation seriously. The reason why the final report wasn't written is because the academic world deprived Adam Zertal and his crew from receiving grants and funds to fund the writing of the final report. Wow. Um, the, and and that they're they're not the only ones that were. Um, that were deprived of, of money. Every Israeli archaeologist that wants to excavate uh, in Judea and Samaria and is looking for funding will not receive it because all the, uh, the funds and all the universities are left-wing left leaning. They will not give money to a place which they see as, as uh, in dispute politically or, or uh, you know, the whole thing mm -hmm. of, Israeli occupation. So, you know, all these, all these uh, claims basically prevent Israeli archaeologists from uh, researching Judea and Samaria freely. And it's, so it's not just the academic world. It's, all, it's also the political environment right. that, that yes. prohibits this type of work. Correct. Now, or slows it now, down. The good news is that we just received a few months ago a very generous donation. Um, so uh, Dr. Shai Bao, our commander, uh, the the the, uh, the person who leads the the team after Zertal's passing uh, is is actually writing the final report as we speak, mm. um, and so hopefully in a few months the final report is finally <laughs> going to be published, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then this, it's going to be a very interesting thing to see, you know, the the discussion in the academic world. But, Will that uh, report include the curse tablets? No. No, okay. It will not, and, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the, the next thing that, uh, that we need to keep in mind is that in the 1990s, Israel signed, a, 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 I don't want to call it a peace treaty because we didn't get a lot of peace out of it, but some sort of a political treaty with the Palestinians, and, and the altar was basically moved to the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority. 
Um, and uh, that, that, that really took it out of Israeli research. Um, and uh, the second thing that had, the third thing that happened is constant vandalism of the site, especially in the last few uh, years. Every week I go to the altar with the tourists and, uh, and I see how the, the structure is being vandalized. Uh, they're, they are burning tires inside of it. They're putting graffiti on, on it. Mm. They are, uh, uh, you know, intentionally throwing the, breaking the, 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 the structure of the altar. Um, and it's really, it's really terrible, terrible. Yeah. And um, so I, I decided to do something about it. And unfortunately, you know, Chai Bao, our, our, our leader of the survey, uh, said, told me that he cannot do anything with that site because it's an area, it's in, a, in the Palestinian area, and we cannot, we cannot do anything. We cannot research it, we cannot do anything. And so I, uh, I approached a, a, a uh, Texan archaeologist by the name of Scott Stripling, and uh, we visited the altar. Scott was amazed by the, the site. Uh, he fell in love with it, just like I did. Uh, Scott has a very strong uh, uh, motivation to, 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 to learn and to investigate sites from the period of Joshua and the judges. That's, what, that's one of the, the aims mm -hmm. of his uh, organization, Associates of Biblical Research. And so uh, sh uh, we did that, and what, what basically we decided to do is to extract the dump of Adam's Zertal. We're not excavating because we can't. What we're doing is we're taking the, the dump that was already excavated from the site um, and uh, moving it to another location where Scott and his crew came with a, a, a wet sifting station. And uh, what they did was they washed all the material that we brought, which is something that Adam Zertal didn't do. In the yeah, talk about the difference between the dry sifting and the wet sifting. So um, when you excavate and you take the materials out of the archaeological location, um, what every archaeologist must do is dry sifting. You put the materials on a net, you move the net, and you let all the small particles fall down. And what you're left is with stones, but also other things like uh, scarabs and um, you know pottery sherds and other important uh, things that that could be very and uh, could have a great impact on the, on the this research of the site. Um, Adam Zertal uh, did that. He dry sifted and he actually did a very good job at it. Um, unfortunately, he did not wet sift, uh, which means basically to dry sift, but with water. When you wash the particles, you can differentiate between a stone and something that is not a stone. Um, and, uh, and so that's exactly what Scott and his crew did in December of 2019. And uh, after a few days, Scott called there and I something, um, and he shows it to me, and um, he sends it to the university. It's basically a piece of metal, a piece of lead that was folded, and um, they, they tried to basically open it. And because uh, it, it's fragile and it's uh, very old, it starts uh, crumbling, it starts uh, breaking. And so, the, and so uh, uh, Scott sent it to a different uh, lab in the Czech Republic where they have a technology called tomography. And Scott uh, starts receiving scans, which he sent to uh, two philologists uh, from the Haifa University, Dr. Professor Gershon Galil, and also the, uh, Dr. Peter van der Tien, and uh, they go over the scans and they identify ancient Hebrew letters. Um, and uh, the more time passes, the more letters are, are identified, and suddenly you have words, you have sentences. And um, just a few months ago, um, what they did was they, they presented the information um, and this is what you see now is the updated text that uh, that uh, I just received a few weeks ago of the um, text inside the tablet. Now the tablet has two copies of the text, one written on the upper part and one written on the lower part on the other side. 
because these are uh, indentations, um, the, the script actually comes out from the other side. So we don't have just we don't have just two copies. We have actually four copies because each copy does another one on the other side. If you understand. So, what Aaron, I got a question on that. So, yeah, it, it's written at first, right? So, where where before it's folded, you have you have on one side uh, the upper side is is engraved, and then on the other side of it, at the lower portion of it, you have it engraved on that side. Correct? Yes. Okay, and then the same text yes well uh, with a slight difference yes okay and then and then the other two areas are are, are there engravings in those other two areas no uh, when you engrave on one side it comes out from the other i see what you're saying right okay so, so you've got you've got indentations one side has upper indentations and lower whatever coming outward toward you we, we call it a negative and a positive okay so you have a negative and a positive and a positive and a negative okay and so there's uh, four there's four copies of the text exactly and there. after after the scribe after doing that he folded that piece of lead and we're going to talk about the action of folding uh, and, and its importance in the ancient world mm -hmm. but the text the text that we found was astonishing um and and you know our viewers can see the text here i'm going to read it you are cursed by the god the lord i can't say the name yes but uh yhw you are cursed mm -hmm. by the god the lord cursed you will die cursed cursed you will surely die cursed you are by the lord cursed um this is the the most ancient uh hebrew text that was found ever and in the land of israel uh let's let's talk a bit about the well that's already a phenomenal find then obviously yes, because i think what, what's the next the next latest find of hebrew script i mean i know there's something in about under zedekiah there was something that's found so that's that's in a much later period yes um, there's also probably a, 600 years later there's also the silver scroll with the ironic blessing which right actually, that's right the most ancient uh, copy of, of a verse from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, but what we have here is something that predates those findings by hundreds of years, by probably, you know, four or five hundred years. Yes. Uh, when we talk about that period, we're talking about two other inscriptions that were found. The inscription at the uh, Kiafa, Tel Kiafa, um, in the Elav Valley, where King David and Goliath fought. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a, a major city, a fortified city that was found there. Um, and, in, and inside they found a text that uh, is, is, you know, from the early Iron Age period, that, that period. We also find uh, another place called Izbet Salta, which also has an inscription um, with the same uh, font. It's actually not the text. It, uh, I would say the homework of an Israelite kid who writes the alphabet in, in the order and then just rehearses, which is really, really neat. Anyway, so these are the three inscriptions that we have in the land of Israel from roughly the, the early Iron Age period. Um, and and what's, what's fascinating is, is the, the, the fact that the text is written in the most ancient version, most ancient font of alphabet called Proto-Alphabetic Script. Uh, sometimes called hieroglyphic Hebrew, because the fonts are actually um, paint are, are sketches of animals or of objects or yes. body parts. Uh, for example, the letter Yud um, is is a, a hand in Hebrew mm -hmm. Yad. Yes, it starts yeah. with the, with the letter Yud and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so so what yeah. we see is is is, is a, a, a text that in a tablet that was found inside Joshua's altar and was that later thrown out to the dump by Zertal in the 1980s. Um, a, a, it's a curse tablet that was found on Mount Ibal, which is the mountain of curse, according to the, the Bible, which is also very interesting. Um, and uh, we have the, the, the name of the Lord appearing there for the first time uh, so early in our history, um, in, in the land of Israel, 
and people can see that it's not the modern Hebrew that we use today. Uh, it, it's actually even more complicated than that because uh, the way it's written is from left to right, whereas today we, we write yeah, from that. right to left. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time, the direction of the writing wasn't standardized. Uh, okay. So, so you could write from left to right, from right to left, sometimes in the same text, from right to left and to left and left to right. So here we have the name of the Lord as an Israelite scribe wrote it uh, in the year 1300 or 1400 BC, which is just remarkable, amazing, exciting. Um, personally, for me, as sure. a Jew, to see that is just mind-blowing. And uh, I, can't, I can't even describe how deep it goes. Um, <clears throat> so let's just go uh, and, and talk about the, the text. The text has 48 letters inside, 46 letters outside, total of 94 letters. The name of the Lord, YHW, appears four times. Uh, the names uh, of the Lord and L, which is another name of, of God, appears together. Um, the text is written in a complex way called chiastic parallelism, mm -hmm. which, which shows intelligence, which shows uh, uh, talent. Yeah, uh, our, 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 the podcast followers are very familiar with chiasmus. Yes, the, the letter, the, the, letter, the um, words are sometimes violized and sometimes are not. And uh, this is the most ancient version of Hebrew font. Um, let's talk about the, the Aaron, Aaron the, the, the name of the Lord here, um, the YHW here being here. How does that go against the grain of, of the bibl biblical scholarship narrative? Okay, so according, you have to understand the reason the, the academic world uh, ha, has said the following one, the Israelites. Um, were, were at, the, at, at the early Iron Age, late Bronze Age, uh, were pagans. They worshipped El. The like worship the of YHW, of the Lord, yes. The, the worship of YHW only came later on, I would say, at the uh, year 800 or 700 BCE. Yeah, with the Deuteronomy. And it, it actually... Yeah. And it actually came from the Northern Kingdom, because mm -hmm. that's where you see uh, kings that are starting, the Israelite kings that are starting to include the name YHW in their name. Mm -hmm. So Yehu uh, is, is actually, well, suddenly it, it goes into Judea as well. So you have kings um, that, that are incorporating that name in their name. But mm -hmm. prior to that, you can't find the, the 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 name of the Lord inside you know biblical names that appear in the Bible. Um, you know, just to give give another a few couple of examples. We have Elijah in Hebrew Eliyahu. Uh, we have Prophet Jeremiah Yirmiyahu. Uh, we have uh, um, um, so, so many almost all the names Uriah have you that. But 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 it go it comes up, it, it it you you read it in the Bible in a much later period. So the academic world says the Israelites could not have worshipped the Lord YHW at the time of Joshua and uh, and Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here for the first time uh, we have a text uh, that includes not just the name of the Lord YHW in Israel in a cultic site of the Israelites, but actually has both names, both YHW and L mm -hmm. on, both, on, on the same text. And, and so this is definitely a knockout to that theory that, believe me, so many books were written on it, so many papers were written on it, that well, the Israelites didn't, <laughs> didn't worship YHW. And now, yes. <laughs> guess what's going to happen to those books? Yeah. So, so yeah, so this is definitely a, one of those uh, big, uh, big uh, atomic bombs that are going to be exploding very soon in the academic world. So yeah. let, let's just summarize the, the importance of this, this uh, text. First of all, uh, the Israelite religion did adopt the name of the Lord YHW, the way it was revealed 
um, in Mount Sinai. They did believe in it. They did worship this God during the time of Joshua, which again fits the biblical narrative and not the academic narrative. Um, another thing that, that we need to, to remember, and this is for me is very important, when you read the book of Exodus, God says to Moses, I appear to the patriarchs of El Shaddai. This was my name. Mm-hmm. But as the Lord, YHW, I did not appear to them. And so when you're going to the Israelites, you're going to tell them, I am that I am, but also YHW is my name. Mm-hmm. So so the, the revelation of God's name as YHW only came to Moses at Mount Sinai. So for me, personally, seeing that name appear on the lead tablet of Mount Ibal is another uh, a, a proof or another evidence for the Sinai revelation. By the way, we're going to celebrate Pent- Pentecost Shavuot this week. Yes. And tomorrow, tomorrow night, the Jewish people are going to celebrate Shavuot, which is which is deemed to be the the, the time of the receiving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. And so let's repeat. So we have the uh, we have the name of the Lord uh, as part of the Israelite religion. We have the Israelite ethnicity because this is a Hebrew text. Uh, Israelites were not illiterate, semi-nomadic, uh, uh, backwarded people. They were were very literate. They could even re- write a text in in in, in a, 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 a parallel. A chiastic parallelism, which shows how complex their writing was. The guy that wrote this uh, didn't have just an amazing ability to write really, really small letters and a very tiny piece That's of important. Lead, yeah. which is very remarkable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was also able to write a complex text, which means that he could also have writ- written or, or copied a, a, much com- a much complex text like the Bible. Mm-hmm. So this is definitely a part of that. Um, the fact that we have curses on a curse tablet on Mount Ibal, which is the mountain of curse, um, is not a coincidence. It can't be a coincidence. Um, and uh, let's, let's even say that the fact that we have 12 curses in the book of Deuteronomy that are supposed to be called or uttered uh, during the ceremony on Mount Ibal, and now we have a curse tablet that has six cursed on one side, cursed, six cursed on the other, total of 12, just like the tribes are commanded to stand on both sides of the mountain and yeah. say amen to, to 12 curses. So we have this number suddenly appearing on this tablet. Is this another coincidence? No. I don't think so. No, it um, is what it is. I mean, it's, it is, it is what it is. So... <laughs> um, uh, let's, let's take the share, the screen share off here for a second. I've got just to finish here. I've just got a couple additional questions here. We, you and I talked a little bit about your theory on, on the metal inscription. Well, let me back up for a second. Let's go back to the, you know, you got Mount Gerasim on one side, you've got Mount Ebala on the other. Um, you take six tribes over to Gerasim. You take six tribes over to Mount Ebal. One side, Gerasim is the blessings. Uh, Ebal is the cursings. You know, you have a, I go over this sometimes on the podcast. You have, you know, the, the ancient Israelites didn't, they don't make covenants. They, they cut covenants, right? Cut by eat. And so you've got a, you've got a, basically a cutting in a sense, a, a split between the tribes that are there. And a part of this eventually bringing them together, which is what covenant means. Covenary means to come together. Um, you have cursings. You have, and we could also call them penalties, right? That go along with this strong, uh, uh, th- this covenantal language and, and, and event that's happening here. What, um, well, I'm trying to think of where I was leading with that, but what, what is, oh, I know what, l- let me go back to the, to the idea of the, of the, of the metal on this. You had a little theory on the metal that you and I talked about. These, th- these are lead tablets. And I think it's important to understand just how this thing's about, I think I'm pretty sure it's less than an inch square. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so I mean it's tiny, and and yet there's inscriptions on this, um, lines on each quarter of this, uh, so it's very small inscriptions, very tiny inscriptions, into lead. 
is your lead. And, you know, previous to that, you brought up, uh, previous to that, there was a silver, right? The silver scroll that, that's written as well. So metal inscription is an important thing or a thing to ancient Israel. What was your theory on lead that you told me about? So when, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the things that, uh, that we as believers, um, we don't need proof. We don't need um, archaeological evidence to prove God's existence or the the events in, that are described in the Bible. Um, but when we find proof, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for us as Bible believers, what, what aside from the excitement, is what can the archaeological evidence teach us more about the Bible that we we don't know or that we didn't notice before. And, uh, and so, you know, finding this lead tablet with a curse on it kind of sent me and Scott and, and other, other Bible scholars to look, to relook at the Bible and, and try to, to see if there's any evidence of writing on, um, on, on lead or, or on metal anywhere in the Bible. And guess what? There is a lot. Um, and uh, specifically on lead. Uh, and so we, we see in the book of Job um, that uh, there is a, a clear a description of um, writing on lead. It says in Job 19 that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. So what we, could, when, what we learn from this verse, from one of the most ancient books of the Bible, the book of Job, is that that there is definitely writing on metal and specifically on lead and that writing on lead means that it's kept forever um so this is definitely something that shows uh, a, 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 and again we've been reading this verse for for thousands of years but not in the context of finding a lead tablet mm -hmm. on the mountain of curse um, and then, you know, we continue looking and we see that the book of Zechariah specifically talks about lead as being a, a curse a metal, of, of, of having a spe spe specific uh, importance to it, uh, I'd say a spiritual character mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to lead. And so lead is curse. Lead is, 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 is identified with the negativity of, of curses. Um, and, and, you know, when we look at other metals in the Bible, uh, we see that, uh, you know, on, on the forehead of the high priest, uh, they had a, a plate of pure gold, uh, and on it was engraved, holy to the Lord. And so in this case, gold is, 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 a, is a metal with a positive character, a character that is fit to the Lord, that is fit to... To, 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 the, to the divine realms um, and, and not to, to, ne to any negative uh, uh, aspects. So, so th this is, again, something that, that for us as Bible believers is, 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 is uh, it, 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 it's news. It's like, mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, it kind of highlights things that we've never noticed before. Yeah, yeah. Both and Aaron, for all the, for those that are listening <laughs> right now, that because exactly. many listeners here have been and will probably again go to or for the first time go to Israel and they need a good tour, right? Where do they go to? Is it lipkintours.com? Yes. So they want to see uh, Joshua's uh, altar and we, other sites. We arrange tours to all the major. And, and so people are more than invited to contact us through our website at www.lipkin, L I P K I N, tours. T O U R S, lipkintours.com, and we'll be happy to host you in Israel. Uh, if you have any uh, churches that want to arrange group tours, uh, that's that's actually our expertise. So we'll be happy to host um, uh, Latter day Saints, Saints uh, groups in Israel and uh, specifically visit the Joshua Zoltier and the amazing footprint structures, as well as Shiloh, Bethel, and the other important sites. Great. Wonderful. We'll put that link in the description as well. So people have that uh, ready for them. Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Greg. Same All right. Here. Thanks, Aaron.
שלום, שלום. שלום, שלום. All right.